The 1974 World Cup was most famously the World Cup of Cruyff and Meikles, and the exposure of the Netherlands' total football to a global audience, as triumphant losers, who fell at the final hurdle to their great rivals West Germany, despite having taken the lead within the first two minutes of the final. Despite the genius of Cruyff and his comrades, the most iconic moment of the finals in West Germany, and quite possibly the most replayed moment, was provided by the tournament's least successful team. In their final group game against Brazil, fresh off the back of a 9-0 thumping by Yugoslavia, Zaire defender Moepu Alunga charged out of Zaire's defensive wall before the Brazilian free kick had been taken, and sent the ball flying into the opposition's half. I can first remember watching that clip when I was about 7 years old on a 1996 VHS release entitled Nick Hancock's Football Nightmares, which was a sort of compilation of footballing bloopers and unusual moments set to a backdrop of Nick Hancock trying to find his way to a Stoke City match, only to find it has been postponed due to it being broadcast live in Tonga. If you're wondering why I remember that quite so well, it's because I watched it about 50 times before VHS players became obsolete, along with similar videos from countless other sporting figures or minor celebrities. There was Ricky Hatton's Hot Shots, Soccer Shockers with Bradley Walsh, Ian Wright's It Really Shouldn't Happen to a Footballer, and the Ricky Tomlinson classic simply entitled Football My Ass. There were those and countless others, relics of a bygone era, disposed of with a simple change in format in which videos are produced, but not forgotten by me at least. To my naive seven or eight year old mind, the Zaire fullback had kicked the ball rather than defending an incoming free kick because he didn't understand the rules. In fairness, to my seven or eight year old mind, it was rather aided and abetted in that regard by the commentary of Nick Hancock, who described the Zaire side as a team full of nuts, claiming that the Zaire team weren't wantonly breaking the rules as some teams did, but just didn't know them. Now, in fairness to Nick Hancock, who I also wouldn't like to be too hard on, given how he clearly played quite a significant role in my early development, he was only perpetuating a myth that has long been common in footballing circles, rather than giving birth to such an idea. He's only a pawn in their game, to quote Bob Dylan. The idea that Zaire went to the 1974 World Cup without really knowing how to play football is a pervasive one among those who have any interest in the sport, but under closer scrutiny, such a claim is exposed as being obviously absurd. At the time, Africa was only permitted one team to qualify for the World Cup, making it an incredibly competitive qualification process. Morocco had been Africa's representatives at the previous World Cup in Mexico, falling into group stages, following defeats to West Germany and Peru, along with a draw against Bulgaria. Although Morocco hadn't progressed, they had given a decent account of themselves, especially in their narrow 2-1 defeat to 1966 World Cup finalists and later 1974 World Cup winners, West Germany. In 1974 World Cup qualifying, Morocco once again looked like strong candidates. A brutal three-round, two-legged straight knockout format was employed by the Confederation of African Football, resulting in just three teams reaching the final stage, which would be decided by a group format, with each team facing off twice. Morocco once again reached the final round, along with Zaire and Zambia, but they would win just one of their four games in the final group stage. Zaire were a class apart, including the best team in Africa at the time, as they won all four of their games, scoring nine goals and conceding only once, including an emphatic 3-0 win against previous African World Cup representatives Morocco. If Morocco could give a decent account of themselves at the World Cup, and Zaire could waltz past Morocco a few years later, perhaps they could go into the 1974 World Cup with some confidence. The draw in January 1974 was unkind to Zaire, though pitting them against a strong Scotland side, former World Cup semi-finalist Yugoslavia, and the reigning world champions Brazil. It was a special draw in some respects for Zaire's head coach, Blagoj Vidinic, though, a former Yugoslavia international who had won Olympic gold with Yugoslavia and had also managed Morocco at the previous World Cup. Aside from a reunion with his native nation, though, Blagoj Vidinic knew that he was up against it. Prior to the finals in Europe, Zaire re-emphasised their supremacy in Africa by winning their second African Cup of Nations, with Undai Malamba scoring nine goals in six games as Zaire took the African crown. With Morocco, Vidinic had created a disciplined and patient side who were happy to sit back and soak up pressure before attempting to spring away on the counter-attack, something that was unusual for an African team at the time. This wasn't a style that he had replicated with Zaire, who played a fast and punchy brand of football, attacking in waves, and not afraid to go flying into tackles. At a time when nations and regions could still have rather distinct styles, Zaire's approach to the game took their opening opponent Scotland by surprise. 
Scotland in the mid-1970s were not the laughing stock that they are now. They were the only one of the home nations to qualify for the 1974 World Cup, in fact, with a squad that could boast the likes of Jimmy Johnston, Billy Bremner, Kenny Dalglish, and Dennis Law. They would be no one's whipping boys in West Germany, but they needed to overcome Zaire to have a chance of qualifying, with manager Willie Orman stating, if we cannot beat Zaire, then we should pack up our bags and go home. Zaire gave Scotland one or two real scares under the lights at the Westfalen Stadion in Dortmund, but having succeeded in keeping Zaire's star centre forwards quiet, Scotland were able to record a 2-0 win. The Zaire players, whilst disappointed, felt that they had given a good account of themselves, and the international community was largely filled with praise. Zaire's dictator though, President Mobutu, saw things rather differently. Joseph Desiree Mobutu, later to become Mobutu Sese Seko, had come to power in Zaire during the Congo crisis between 1960 and 1965. Congo had suffered 80 years of ruthless and brutal colonial oppression, firstly as the Congo Free State, and then as Belgian Congo prior to gaining independence, but the power vacuum left behind following Belgium's exit from the Congo led to a bloody civil war and part Cold War proxy war between the United States and the Soviet Union that would cost over 100,000 lives. From this mess emerged President Mobutu, who carried out a military coup in November 1965 and had eliminated all opposing political parties before the decade was done. Mobutu was a flamboyant man, popular with the United States, France, Belgium, and even China due to his fierce opposition to the Soviet Union, but he led a brutal regime from a palace that he had built for himself, in a town he had built for himself called Badalite, which was equipped with an airport, colleges, and shopping centres, but now lies in abandoned ruins. When he wasn't having Picasso paintings put up at his palace, flying on Concorde, or siphoning off $5 billion of public funds, the man with the leopard skin hat was ordering the death and torture of anyone who dared to commit the crime of opposing him. Like most dictators, there was little that mattered more to Mobutu than image, and particularly the image that he portrayed across the globe, not just at home. Shortly after Zaire's appearance at the 1974 World Cup, Mobutu famously brought the heavyweight world title bout between George Foreman and Muhammad Ali to Zaire's capital Kinshasa, along with the help of some cash from Colonel Gaddafi in what became known as the Rumble in the Jungle. Football was another way for Mobutu to project Zaire's power and reputation across the globe, and following his nation's performances in qualifying and at the African Cup of Nations, Mobutu is said to have garnered some rather unrealistic expectations for his novice national team, who were, in spite of their fine form in Africa, still only the first nation from sub-Saharan Africa to ever reach a World Cup Finals. Following qualification, Mobutu had invited Zaire's players to his palace in Badalite to shower them with gifts and praise. Zaire's national football team operated primarily on a performance-based bonus system, rather like struggling YouTubers who don't own their own channel, and the team's fine form on the continent of Africa had led to lavish gifts by the players' standards in return. Since the World Cup was, and indeed still is, the pinnacle of world football, the Zaire players had expected generous remuneration for their efforts, twinned with an understanding of the quality of the opposition they were up against. They would receive neither. A kitty had been set up for the travelling Zaire contingent to West Germany, but this didn't just include the players, but also officials and diplomats close to Mobutu. Following their first game, a respectable show against Scotland, the Zaire players discovered that all the money had been bled dry by those officials and the non-playing contingent of Zaire's representatives in Europe. Having been away from their family for two months, with almost no communication and having expected the World Cup to be their biggest payday yet, Zaire's players were outraged. They flat out refused to play in Zaire's next group game against Yugoslavia before receiving threats of imprisonment upon their return home should they refuse to take to the pitch, as well as being persuaded by desperate FIFA officials who were terrified of the damage to their reputation a no-show at the tournament could cause. The Zaire players were reluctantly obliged, but they might as well have remained in the dressing room. In what some of their players described as a protest performance, Zaire showed none of the desire, appetite, and constant willingness to attack that had endeared them to so many across the world against Scotland, and instead just watched on as Yugoslavia scored nine goals with none in return, equaling a joint record, heaviest World Cup defeat of all time. Mobutu was incensed by the perceived national and personal humiliation suffered by Zaire's team with the players receiving information that should they lose by more than a three or five gold margin, depending on which sources you believe, in their final group game against Brazil, they would not be allowed to return home to their families. Zaire lost the game to Brazil 3-0 in Gelsenkirchen, as an incensed squad of players were comfortably beaten, but at least ensured a safe passage home. 
It was during that game that Brazil won a free kick on the edge of Zaya's box, with some of the finest set-piece specialists in world football at that time lining up to take it. Muepu Alunga, a right-back who had been one of the most vocal members of the Zaya squad, decided in that moment to run out from a crowded Zaya defensive wall and strike the ball with all the anger and venom that had been harboured within the Zaya camp. Alunga later claimed that he had been goaded by the Brazilian players, but also that he wanted to get sent off as one final act of defiance before Zaya was sent packing from a tournament that should have been a landmark moment for a team from sub-Saharan Africa. For years, and in actual fact to this day, the common perception outside of Africa has been that Alunga didn't know the rules. Somehow, a man who played for one of the biggest clubs in Zaire, won an African Cup of Nations and won 21 caps for the best team in the continent, suddenly thought that a player from the team who concedes a free kick has to form a wall, stand back, and then just run out and randomly smash the ball into Rosette. Hopefully, I am phrasing the situation succinctly enough to make it clear how absurd such a suggestion really is. And somehow, it seems to play into the stereotype that black people and Africans somehow lack intelligence, both on and off a football pitch, an idea that was very common in Europe during the mid-1970s, and one that still exists, perhaps below the surface, now in many circles. Had it been a Polish or Canadian player who had rushed out of a defensive wall and smashed an opposition's free kick into no man's land, despite having been an established international at a World Cup, one wonders whether people would have so readily concluded that, oh, look at that. The silly Canadian, he doesn't know the rules. How charming and funny. Or whether they would have thought, that's strange. Perhaps it was an act of protestation, defiance, or at the most pejorative, perhaps mere petulance, or an attempt to waste time by kicking the ball away in a very elaborate and blatant fashion. President Mobutu was overthrown in the First Congo War in 1997 and exiled to Morocco, where he died later that year. He was replaced by Laurent Desiree Kabila, but a year later, the Second Congo War began, which would become the bloodiest known conflict in both African and modern worldwide history, claiming an estimated 3.6 million lives, but possibly as many as 6 million, primarily through disease and starvation. Laurent Desiree Kabila was himself assassinated by his bodyguard in 2001, replaced by his son Joseph Kabila, who led DR Congo until 2019, with the nation having their first democratic elections since 1965 in 2006. Whilst the devastating Second Congo War officially ended in 2003, Congo has never truly known peace. The current state of DR Congo is one of corruption, rebel groups, rival factions, and constant conflict. DR Congo is a vast nation, larger in terms of landmass than Mexico or Indonesia, and with a larger population than either Germany or Turkey. DR Congo is actually a nation which is extremely rich in natural resources, from valuable minerals to copper, diamonds, and gold. But rather than being a recipe for wealth generation, Congo's problematic past means its inherent wealth has actually just been an added incentive towards violence. According to most indices, DR Congo ranks among the 10 richest countries on Earth in terms of natural resources, alongside the likes of Russia and the United States. However, in terms of gross domestic product per capita, which is commonly used to rank the actual wealth of nations, DR Congo ranks as the third poorest nation on Earth in terms of those for whom there is reliable data, poorer than the likes of Rwanda and Haiti. The combined life expectancy for men and women in DR Congo is just over 60, putting it among the lowest on earth. It's a desperately sad situation, and given the damage that diseases like cholera have caused in the region, the arrival of coronavirus could add untold misery to a nation which already has millions in dire need of humanitarian aid. Muepu Alunga, the fullback who famously booted that free kick against Brazil, died in May 2015 following a long battle with illness at the age of 65. He told journalists a year before he died that he still hadn't been paid for his performances at the 1974 World Cup. Whilst the Zaire team of 74 are viewed as a laughingstock by outsiders, with warped understandings of what happened to them at that World Cup, in truth, they were trailblazers. A brilliant team within Africa, at a time when African football was still very much in a developmental stage, their fast-paced, daring and attacking football set the mould in so many respects, and played a major role in increasing the sport's popularity and influencing its style throughout Africa. Without Zaire in 1974, we may never have had Cameroon at Italia 90, Senegal in 2002, or Ghana at the first World Cup hosted in Africa in 2010. So next time you see that clip, now you know.
A huge thank you to you all for watching. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe to HITC7s. And if you're fortunate enough to be able to, why not donate to a charity like Save the Children to provide humanitarian relief in countries like DR Congo, Yemen, and Syria, where many people are suffering from disease, destitution, and oftentimes death on a scale most of us, thankfully, will never have to experience. Thanks again for watching, and if you'd like to watch another mini documentary relating to the 1974 World Cup, feel free to click on the thumbnail on the bottom right hand side of your screen now.